Senator Ludlam. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to um, dedicate this speech to a gentleman, an Indian gentleman called Anthony Sami, who's 40 years old, not somebody that I've ever met before. Um, in the context uh, of, uh, of what's happening around the world this week in the nuclear industry, and this week just gone is being hailed as the worst ever for the nuclear industry. I suspect that is contestable. There's a lot of competition, obviously. The worst week might have been when Soviet engineers blew the Chernobyl plant apart and showered much of Western Europe and then the Northern Hemisphere with radiation. The worst week, you could say, might have been uh, March of last year uh, when the ongoing disaster at uh, Fukushima Daiichi began. Of course, the worst week in the nuclear industry really depends on where you stand. The worst week for the Aboriginal mob living around Maralinga was probably sometime in the 1950s when the British were lighting up their country with the light of a thousand suns and showering their traditional uh, home grounds with uh, fission products from nuclear weapons. But last week was, in fact, a real shocker. Um, which brings me to the story of, of Mr Anthony Sami. He was shot dead in India, uh, in Tamil Nadu, by Indian police for being part of the demonstration against the Kudankulam nuclear reactor. He was part of demonstrations that are tens of thousands strong across India, not just in the southern part in Tamil Nadu, but across the country, uh, where nuclear plants are being forced on people literally at gunpoint. This is a part of the world where our own Prime Minister will visit in mid-October. Uh, and of course, if she's continuing to do the bidding of Minister Martin Ferguson, who really only sees um, the dollar signs when, when he contemplates uranium, um, she will be there to advance the pouring, presumably, of Australian uranium into reactors that have some of the, the worst health and safety records uh, in a state that is armed with nuclear weapons, in a state that has not signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and in a state where nuclear technology, particularly by the people close to the plants, is desperately unpopular. This is linked to the fortunes of the nuclear industry worldwide. These demonstrations are part of a much larger global campaign that is now into its third generation to bring the nuclear age to a close. Last week, the Japanese government made a decision to phase out nuclear power by the 2030s. That, I suspect, will anger some of my Japanese colleagues and many of the tens of millions of people who are campaigning not simply for a closure at some time into the future, but for the reactors to never be restarted again in this small, seismically active country. Uh, it's highly significant for us here in Australia, it's certainly very significant for those uh, who live in Japan, that one of the countries in the world, a very high-tech, technologically sophisticated country, but one of those most invested in nuclear energy, has finally listened to its population and said enough is enough, having lost a large part of Fukushima Prefecture, they know uh, just how much worse that situation could have been, and now they are moving for a total phase-out. That is the same as the governments of Germany, Italy and Switzerland, where a full phase-out of this technology is now underway. In Japan, the struggle of fishing uh, communities and the community around Kiminoseki celebrated their, their work, which is now in its fourth decade. Uh, to prevent their livelihoods being destroyed by a proposed nuclear plant. Their fight was an extraordinary show of endurance, and I'm happy to pay it tribute tonight. When the company would come along to dig, the community would thread their fishing boats together, effectively blocking access to the port. This community resisted for 40 years. This week they won. Last week, two reactors were shut down in Belgium indefinitely due to cracks found in the reactor vessels. Last week, Spain decided not to renew a plant's licence to operate in Girona in July of next year. In Canada, the government agreed to close the Gentili II reactor on safety grounds, and the President of France, another country that some Australian pro-nuclear advocates look to as being technologically sophisticated, also a nuclear weapons state, um, relying um, to a very large part, much more vulnerable to this technology even than the people of Japan in terms of energy supply, the President of France announced that the oldest reactor there will be de decommissioned. And in fact, the ruling party wants to reduce nuclear's share um, from 75 to 50 per cent of energy by 2025. Another country in which, if this technology is so great, why are they backing away as rapidly as, as alternative sources of supply will allow? 
Not surprisingly, last week the uranium spot price fell to below 48 US dollars a pound. That's the lowest level since December 2010, and it's down from $73 a pound just before the disaster in uh, Tohoku in March of last year. And against this backdrop, here's where Australia comes in. What do we think the Australian Uranium Association was doing during this most dismal week for the nuclear industry and this wave of closures and proposed closures around the world? Well, the AUA was up in Queensland with the Queensland Resources Council pushing for the government of Queensland to lift the ban on uranium mining. Um, Mr Newman was pretty tight-lipped and actually presented quite an ambiguous position to the people of Queensland before the last state election, which was disappointing, but they haven't actually lifted the ban as yet. Um, the Resources Minister of Queensland, Mr Andrew Cripps, who obviously hasn't really been keeping up with developments in the world nuclear fuel market, joined the predictable call for discussion in Queensland. Well, discuss away, Mr Cripps, as long as you are doing so in possession of the facts of what is occurring in this industry. Our uranium customer base, the people that we rely on as the market to sell this material to, is drying up because the technology is disastrous. BHP Billiton boss Marius Kloppers attributed the Olympic Dan postponement not to the carbon price, as Mr Abbott would have known if he'd bothered to read their statement on the night that BHP announced the Olympic Dan proposal was being postponed. What he said was, what has changed is the capital cost of construction. What has changed also is that post Fukushima there is a different and still developing outlook on uranium. Let's talk a little more about that developing outlook. Um, it was uh, very, very interesting and, and a bit sad because I've got a lot of regard for Senator Williams of the National Party who took a shot at my colleague Senator Rhiannon for having, in his words, investments, plural, in ERA, a, a uranium mining company that takes uranium from Kakadu and sells it all over the world. Um, Senator Williams used the word investments. This is a single share held by Senator Rhiannon for the purpose of being able to go to AGMs and ask hard questions as a shareholder of the company. Um, Senator Rhiannon's not hoping to make a handy profit out of her $8 ERA share. In fact, if she was, I would have advised her to sell it, because in a couple of years it's going to be worthless. So for Senator Williams to come in here and take a shot that somehow uh, Senator Rhiannon is, is uh, you know, voting uh, against her principles by buying a single share in a uranium mining company, I just have two words, shareholder activism. Perhaps that's something uh, that the National Party would consider. So I would be advising Senator Rhiannon to sell that share if she was in it for the money, but of course she's not. And uh, having attended a number of uranium company AGMs over time, they're not pleasant experiences, but they're extremely worthwhile. Investors in the Toro project, I'd be advising them about now to sell up on their stake as well before their shares become completely worthless, which will happen if Toro goes ahead against market advice and goes for a capital raise, a raising to build its mill. It will be diluting the value of its existing shareholders out of existence. Toro has sponsored all sorts of speaking tours, including by Dr Doug Borum, who promoted radiation as anti-carcinogenic at the Pay Dirt Uranium Conference in Adelaide. It would be a bit like the cigarette industry, the tobacco industry, uh, promoting uh, doctors. If you find a doctor somewhere in the world who could say that cigarettes are anti-carcinogenic and then shopping them around and getting, trying to get him on TV. That is the kind of um, behaviour that the uranium industry um, is undertaking and conducting. And its peak body, the Australian Uranium Association, didn't call them on it, didn't call them out. That is the kind of ethical um, um, practice that we're dealing with, or malpractice. So Toro is, is actually in quite a desperate situation now. They have a small, uh, geologically intractable um, calcrete deposit which they propose to mine across a lake bed. They've got no experience in mining. They've got no cash reserves. They've got no joint venture partner. And their parent company, Oz Minerals, calls them a non-core asset. Toro is in serious trouble. I, uh, I uh, think that if you were actually holding an investment in this company, now is probably a very, very good time to get out. As we speak, a group of extremely determined people are walking to protest this uranium mine across a lake bed at Lake Way. The Walkatura walkabout is being led by a friend and colleague of mine, Cato Muir, who's a traditional owner um, from the gold fields. And these people are walking for country to reconnect people with land and culture. And he says in his invitation, this pilgrimage across uh, Wonkaja country in the spirit of ancestors is being held together so that we as present custodians can protect our land and our culture for future generations. Cato is linked um, with Mr Sami. Cato is linked with the child who was put in hospital by being hit in the head with a tear gas canister. 
Uh, he and his uh, friends and allies around Australia who are working to an end for this uh, insidious and poisonous and obsolete industry are linked with the 25,000 people demonstrating in Tamil against the construction of a nuclear reactor in their back backyards that nobody in Australia, in their right minds, would want to live next to. So I call on the Prime Minister, hear these voices. Time has expired. Senator Faulkner.